Welcome to my world. Two escargot, pate, frise, two green salads. Okay, man, it's not here. Lamb chop, steak frites. Shouldn't you be doing something? Two faux filet and a pepper steak. Come on, make the dessert. Chocolate tart, please. As a cook, tastes and smells are my memories. And now I'm in search of new ones. So I'm leaving New York City and hope to have a few epiphanies around the world. And I'm willing to go to some lengths to do that. I am looking for extremes of emotion and experience. I'll try anything. I'll risk everything. I have nothing to lose. Traveling through Cambodia, one could experience a wide array of tastes, smells, and textures, from the mysterious kelp-like jello to fried insects and little birds, some things completely unidentifiable. Today, I'm starting a two-day journey to an outpost on the western edge of the country, near Thailand, for a little taste of border town cuisine and life. I've already decided early on that as part of my whole obsession with Apocalypse Now, I want to go upriver, just like they did in the movie, to the scariest place on Earth. And I'm reliably informed that the scariest place on Earth, in Cambodia anyway, is the Khmer Rouge stronghold of Pai Lin, which until recently was inaccessible to any Westerner. Okay, we're on the SS Minnow, on the first leg of our journey to uh, Pai Lin via Barambang. Pai Lin is uh, the place that some genius recommended that I go. And his description of it at the time was, oh, you'll, you'll love this joint. It's, uh, it's populated by uh, black market diamond merchants, timber merchants, Khmer Rouge, and uh, described it to me as sort of like border town in Mad Max 3. Sounds pretty good to me. And here's the kicker. This one-time Khmer Rouge model town is these days the center of vice and gambling. And gambling means casino. And casino means buffet, right? So, I think we're reasonably sure we can get Beef Wellington there and Escargot Bourguignon, right? All the casinos have that, right? Basically, this place was described as sort of the last place in the world that any sensible tourist would want to go. So naturally, we're going there. So we head out across Lake Tonle Sap in search of the river that will take us into the heart of darkness. My ride isn't the Miami Vice cigarette boat that I'd imagined, but I've come prepared. I've procured some imported Western fare from my hotel. All right, I picked this little jewel of a recipe up from Martha Stewart's last TV special, Cambodian River Journey Picnics. You probably saw it. First, dress a deck chair with a red and white checkered scarf. Borrow it from one of your Khmer Rouge friends. Then, a little hard Italian salami, some honey-baked ham, gently warmed camembert, and fresh baguettes. All accompanied by a crisp Bordeaux Blanc. It really is a good thing. We're pushing up river at a good clip, glimpsing snippets of day-to-day -day river life. It's all very relaxing. So I take a little nap. And that's when things turn. We make an unscheduled stop and pick up three lads wearing olive drab. Three mysterious travelers. Oh, no, 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 they assure our skipper. You don't want to go this way. You want to take a shortcut. The word shortcut always fills me with dread, especially when it's sinister looking guys in army fatigues. Is he a cop? Is he a disgruntled ex Khmer Rouge? Is he a madman? Is he going to stand up, whip out a meat axe, and start disemboweling me? I'm thinking deliverance. <laughs> the deeper and farther we go upriver, the more back into the Stone Age we seem to be going. People are living in sticks and huts. We don't get a lot of hellos and waves and happy smiles. I'm not liking this. I don't know where I'm going, and I'm thinking if the propeller fouls, if we get grounded, I won't be seeing my local American Express representative. I'm getting scared. I thought I wanted Apocalypse Now, 
How romantic. I get to go up the river in search of Kurtz. Hey, that was the love boat compared to this. I don't remember the episode of Gilligan's Island where Gilligan gets, like, kidnapped and killed. Do you? Life at its best and its most vivid is often a mixture of fear and excitement. By the time I hit Batambang, I am both excited and afraid. Six and a half blistering hours on a no-name river, and we're finally pulling into shore. This meal I'm headed toward better be a Michelin star quality. Well, we finally reach Batambang, which is about halfway on our journey. I'm pretty happy to see dry ground at this point. Okay, we're on the uh, fabled Road to Pailin, which uh, is intermittently a moonscape and pool-sized uh, vats of sort of uh, wet chocolate brownie. I'm told the cars can disappear into these potholes and never come out. What was that sign? The most heavily mined part of the country is the Batambang and Pailin area. But mines are a problem all over Cambodia. In short, do not stray from well-marked paths under any circumstances. It's a little intimidating. The frequency of landmine warnings, including particularly lurid paintings of the aftermath of stepping on a landmine. This is uh, not the Vince Lombardi rest stop. Stick to the main road. Seems like a good idea, right? Halfway down the road to Pailin, there's, I guess, their version of the truck stop. A bunch of locals sitting around watching Thai kickboxing, which is very popular in these parts, apparently. And it seems like a hospitable enough little place to tuck into some lunch. I'm having a hearty bowl of somla, a traditional Cambodian one-dish meal. A little chopped pork, fresh lemongrass, chicken broth, and some homemade rice noodles. A little green onion garnish, and voila, lunch is served. Bowl of noodles and pork. A splash of chili sauce and a squeeze of lime, and I'm good to go. Let's go. It's the last bowl of noodle soup. Maybe the last look at a television set for a while. Then nothing else until we hit Pai Lin. All right, next. Next stop, Caesar's Palace, Pai Lin style. I've seen a lot of livestock out here, too, so I figured we can get a good uh, good steak by the pool. I think this should be pretty interesting. And I'm looking forward to that rub down. It's uh, bouncing around a lot in here. Maybe a Caesar salad, I don't know. Maybe a Niçoise salad, what do you think? Dressing on the side. It's been a two-day journey, which began on a nameless river and gave way to one hellish road. We've just driven 75 miles in four and a half hours. We're 15 miles from the Thai border and we finally reached the literal and proverbial end of the road, Pai Lin. I can't wait to sink my teeth into some of that beef wellington at the casino buffet. All right, all right. Listen, Las Vegas looked a little rough too, you know, early on. It used to be a one, ho one hotel town, like the Flamingo, that was it. It's a frontier town, and like most border towns, it's a little rough and it's a little rugged. You know the story. It plays out like that cowboy movie. You know, new guy in town walks into the saloon, the doors swing open, and everybody in the saloon turns around and gives a hostile look. That's the feeling I get in Pai Lin. All right, the action in this one-horse town is probably back at the hotel, the Hang Mai, the only hotel in town. It's not exactly Caesar's Palace. There is the sinister foot stains on the wall there. I admit that's a little creepy and the kind of fluid over there, I see. I, I, I find that the tile's a little unsettling too, you know, like this and the place in bottom bang, they seem to be designed to be hosed down quickly and easily. I gather how this works is you stand here by the bowl and just sort of like hose yourself and the whole bathroom down. I'm guessing this is soap. At first, I thought it was a condom, but uh, it's kind of mushy, so I'm hoping it's so. And the casino's not exactly on the roof. Apparently, it's about uh, 30 clicks outside of town. And I'm told we can't shoot there, uh, as we might ourselves get shot. But hey, we've still got the fine outdoor restaurant. All right, let's rock. There's got to be something happening there.
here we are, lost in Margaritaville. Um, apparently, the, our dreams of a destination resort, a dirt track, go-karts, swing in casinos, Siegfried and Roy have been dashed. So it looks, uh, it looks like I'll be eating Thai food and watching, God help me, cop and a half with Burt Reynolds on the tube here during my meal. Ray Sharkey's in this too. This is like both the good guy and the bad guy in this film have like freakishly bad toupees. I mean, you know, I'm ashamed of being a junkie in my past, but you know, I don't have that under my belt. Okay, it's not the Cambodian Las Vegas I'd been promised, but seeing as though we're on the Thai border, the food should be pretty interesting. While the two countries use similar ingredients, the Thai cuisine is far more intense when it comes to flavor. The turmeric and cumin seem to jump out at you. I'm having spicy Thai chicken, curry, ground peanuts, a little salt and sugar, and scallions. All stir-fried together. I'm also having a very traditional Thai soup, tom yam. Fresh chopped lemongrass and ginger, which is simmered in a chicken broth. Shrimp from the Gulf of Thailand, I hope, is quickly boiled. Coconut milk is added. And the soup is finished with chili oil and fish sauce. While both Cambodian and Thai cuisine have a really nice balance of sweet, sour, salty, and bitter, it's the Thai food that brings the heat. The chili really lifts it. All right, this isn't all that bad, but it's not the casino buffet I'd hoped for. At the earliest moment tomorrow morning, we're gonna slink uh, into our four-wheel drive and beat feet the hell out of here. Bon appetit. Cambodia, with its rich and tragic history, is both unnerving and rewarding. The Khmer people radiate charm and determination, and the cuisine with its subtle use of spices and aromatic herbs is truly memorable. But next time I'm told about some border town meal I just have to check out, I think I'll stay home and order it in. Next stop, Japan, for a change of pace and taste. Japan seems light years away from the western edge of Cambodia. And I'm going to need to slide back into things slowly. A decompression period, if you will. I'm just not ready for an elaborate Japanese dining experience. But my guide and translator, Shinji, assures me he has just the thing. Something familiar, yet something different at the same time. Soba. Soba, as I understand it, is an everyday food. It's a fairly casual thing, yet again, it's taken very seriously. There's good soba, there's mediocre soba, there's bad soba, and there's really, really good soba. This is really, really good soba. Soba differs from Western-style pastas. It's richer in taste, less porous, and it doesn't depend on sauces to give it flavor. If you look at the seriousness with which this stuff is made, the delicacy with which it's handled, the technique and the skill of the chef who's preparing it. It's a pretty impressive sight. Now, what's gone in there so far? But, like buckwheat flour? Buckwheat flour. Water? Water. Those build strong wrists. People who are expert at, at working on the dough seem to handle it very casually. Yeah. You know, very. Up, up, up. It makes it look easy. It's not. If I were doing this, it, the dough it would be breaking, it would stick to the pin, I would be crying. Right now, it looks like pie dough. It's, I mean, that's thin. And really delicate at this point. I mean, look, you, you can see the, like the frame. Look how thin that is. Uh, reverse roll up. Where can we feel out of at this point?
then slices. When he picks up this knife and uh, starts cutting it into absolutely perfect, identical ribbons, hand cutting linguini. So it's thinner than linguini. Hand cutting angel hair, capellini. I mean, I've seen some master pasta makers, you know, guys who make garganellis, uh, they make fettuccine, of course, uh, flat pasta. And I was just absolutely blown away by how good they were and how quick. But, I mean, look at that. I mean, that's like filament thin and uniform. Every strand the same. I would just love to, like, you know, all expenses paid, get this guy on the plane in New York, bring him down to, uh, like, an Italian restaurant and just and do this in front of some pasta cooks. I'll be able to do that while he's sleeping. <laughs> Incredible. There we go. Ox. That's impressive. The freshly prepared soba is then gently placed in boiling water for a mere 30 seconds then shocked in cold water for a minute. It's carefully separated and plated. One of the favorite ways to serve it is, as in this case, cold. At which point it is lifted and just a quick dip. Dumped into a hot, in this case, duck broth with chunks of duck meat, a little bit of scallion, and fresh grated wasabi. It's fabulous. Very subtle, but at the same time, a very hearty and warming dish. Mmm. Well, that's good. And that's appropriate. Dip and then slurp. Yes. Slurping is good, okay. Mmm. <laughs> good, got a nice pitch there. Got a great consistency, too. This is really a treat. It's really good. That's so good. Nothing like it. Soba, just the comfort food I was looking for. When one thinks of Japan, one thinks of formality. You know, proper etiquette. But actually, just beneath the surface is a great casualness and ease. You can just slink down these back alleys, just follow your nose and find a great meal. The scent of yakitori fills the air. Yakitori refers to simple, grilled, skewered items, kind of snack-like, like a shish kebab. The distinctive flavor comes from a marinade made of sugar, soy sauce, and mirin, a sweet rice wine. There are whole neighborhoods here filled with yakitori joint after yakitori joint. The entire neighborhood smells of yakitori. You know when you're getting close. Generally, the places that serve yakitori are fairly informal, very popular with, and catering largely to, business people who've just gotten off work and want to grab a few beers or some sake. We're at a businessman's uh, yakitori joint. Um, you know, a light snack accompanied by generous amounts of alcohol. Place to stop off after work and have a good time. This is the sort of place I would ha hang out in much too much if I lived in Tokyo. This is the sort of place I would get off of work, I'd come here, and I'd hang out much later than I should. And I'd come home drunk. <laughs> I get really lucky at this joint. I sit down, and almost immediately, a large table of Japanese business people sit down, start drinking, pull my table over, <laughs> and start buying rounds. Food tastes better in a, in a comfortable environment. This is perfect. They start ordering up, it seems, everything on the menu. I feel right at home, right away. 24 hours ago, in Pailin, I was greeted with steely stares and cold shoulders. Now I'm embraced. I'm just another salary man out for a good time. This is uh, like elbow cartilage from, from the chicken. And it doesn't sound good, frightening to the Western mind. I've been told ahead of time that this is something I should have, so uh, not scared. But it has a, the, the chewiness and the consistency of uh, calamar, actually. And really flavorful. Crunchy. This is like a meatball, but chicken. Uh, ground chicken, it's a specialty of the house, I understand. Mm. This is, you know, kind of like a big Italian meal. Uh, you know, same thing, everybody's sitting around talking and drinking and eating. Controlled chaos. Sake pouring is yet another little thing I had to learn. Somebody pours you sake, you pour it back for them. This can lead to a breaking of social barriers. Good conversation. I will try that. 
and serious inebriation. It's a very unusual experience. Nothing like this has happened to me in Tokyo before. It's enormously gratifying and a lot of fun. So as I stumble away from the yakitori joint, I'm reminded that just as in Cambodia, it's the simple food and the casual dining experiences that are often the most satisfying and surprisingly memorable.